Hey everyone, in this brief video I'm going to be discussing six key terms which are really important in the study of abnormal psychology. Those are abnormal, whoop, symptom, disorder, disease, diagnosis, and lastly the biopsychosocial model. So I'll go through each of these six terms, just elaborate a little bit on what each of them means and how they'll be important to you in this class, give a couple examples, and then that'll be it. Okay, uh, the first one here is abnormal. What does it mean to be abnormal? It's actually a really complicated question with many different ways of answering it. Um, some of the key things for you to be thinking about though are that of course we've got this uh, root word norm or normal referring to what is most often the case. Right, so the norm of something is the most common or the most frequently occurring form of a variable. And to be abnormal is to somehow deviate from that. So in psychology, some things we might be thinking about are that someone has a psychological experience which is rare, which is unusual, unhelpful, maladaptive could be another word to think of, or in, in some other way, not accepted by society. So some of the key things that we would think of as hallmarks of abnormality would include excess suffering, harm to oneself or others, dangerousness or riskiness, uh, eccentricity, unpredictability, and then of course again just being statistically rare in some way or another. So if you think a little bit about your day-to-day -day experiences with thoughts, behaviors, and emotions, and the thoughts, behaviors, and emotions of other people that you know, you've been alive up until this adult period of your life, and you're probably relatively familiar with what are normal or acceptable thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, and what we would typically call abnormal are the sorts of things that fall outside of those, or are occurring with a frequency which would be outside of the norm. Is it normal to cry? Sure, of course. Is it normal to cry multiple hours of every day? No, not really. So all these things are on a spectrum of some kind, from normal-ish to less normal. Okay, uh, what is a symptom? This is likely something that you've heard before, something that you're familiar with, but just to nail it down with a little more detail, a symptom is a specific reportable problem experienced by someone. So in mental health, a symptom could be anything from an angry outburst to difficulty initiating sleep at night, to crying spells, thoughts of suicidality, hallucinations, delusions, right? You name it, there are all sorts of different kinds of symptoms. But the key idea here is that a symptom is one particular issue. So related to that would be a disorder which is a cluster of those issues. And we'll be studying these disorders throughout the course. There's a number of different kinds of symptoms that tend to co-occur more frequently than others. But the idea basically is just that a symptom is one particular kind of problem, whereas a disorder is a cluster or grouping of those problems. So if somebody is experiencing a cluster of symptoms that includes, for instance, weight gain, suicidality, feelings of guilt, sadness, irritability, sleep problems, and anhedonia, or what is sometimes used to describe um, an inability to experience pleasure for things that used to be fun. That cluster of symptoms is the sort of thing that we would often refer to as depression, or in its clinical term, major depressive disorder. Right, a disorder. Now the key thing about a disorder is that it's different from a disease. So a disease is also a problem cluster, but a disease specifically is a problem cluster in some living being which is medically explained or has a pathophysiological explanation. So these would include things like uh, cancers, heart diseases, liver diseases, asthma, allergies, right? So they are related to symptoms, which might be anything from pain to runny nose, coughing, weakness in certain muscles, um, with a, a cluster of those symptoms involved. 
But the key thing about a disease is that through the science of medicine and physiology, we have a physical understanding of what's going on. With a disorder, we do not have a, a clearly physical explanation of what's going on. There may be physical components to it, but it's not exclusively physical and it's not exclusively clearly explained by existing medical literature. So that's why in abnormal psychology we refer to basically all the things we study, these symptom clusters, as disorders. Because they're not just physical, they're also emotional or they're also uh, cultural, right? Um, so just to give a few more examples, a disorder could include something like schizophrenia, generalized anxiety disorder, and a disease could include things like melanoma, tuberculosis, right? Occasionally there are human experiences that sort of ride the line between the two or appear as largely medical problems but are not yet fully explained. Things like certain forms of arthritis, or Guillain-Barre syndrome, there's other sorts of medical things that don't have a clear pathophysiology. And so those at this time are called disorders. It may be the case that they eventually become diseases when the explanation is available. Or if it truly is a combination of mental and physical issues, then it'll probably remain uh, termed a disorder because that's the best way to describe something that's not exclusively medical, again. Okay, so importantly, these are the concepts for the kinds of symptoms that cluster together. Now, a diagnosis, which is sometimes used interchangeably, but that's not quite correct, is the word for when that symptom cluster has been labeled by a professional. So you go in, you see your doctor, he does a big evaluation with you, and he says, um, you meet criteria for anorexia nervosa. I'm putting it in your chart, that's now a label that I've given you as my patient. Now you have a diagnosis. But importantly, you can have a disorder without a diagnosis, right? There's plenty of people that struggle with mental health problems but never seek a professional's input. Or vice versa, you can be diagnosed with something and the truth is it's not actually an accurate diagnosis. Right? Maybe your diagnostician miscalculated something in the test or read an x-ray wrong or you know, made some sort of honest mistake. So diagnoses and the presence of disorders or diseases function separately. Related, of course, but separate. So that's important to know because we'll talk a little bit later about things like false positives or false negatives. Times when the decision that the diagnostician made was not correct. Lastly here is what's called the biopsychosocial model. Now this is basically a term to describe the all-encompassing comprehensive approach to understanding diseases and disorders which takes into account as many forms of contributing info as possible. And it's kind of written right into the name. So the bio part of biopsychosocial refers to things like studying one's genetics studying one's body and the physiology behind a certain symptom cluster. For instance, when we talk about depression, we know that there are certain uh, differences in the ways that the brain processes serotonin, which could be a contributing factor to depression. There are also genetic links between families. So, from a biological standpoint, we can study reasons why people might be more likely to become depressed. Now the psycho part of psychosocial, biopsychosocial, refers to the psychological components. So people's belief systems, the way that they think, the way that they make sense of unknowns or how they fill in blanks in their minds, and that's sometimes called cognitive attributions. Uh, so the styles with which people think, their dreams, even pieces and parts of their unconscious, uh, this is all what we would call kind of the individual level or the, the psychological level of a disorder. That pr probably seems pretty obvious, but it's, it's worth highlighting, right? Because when we talk about, say, bulimia, it's not exclusively a biological disorder, even though it involves the body and food. It involves the way people think about their bodies and their body image. 
in the way that they want to look. Okay, lastly, the social part of biopsychosocial refers to kind of that highest level, uh, big picture contributors, things like society's value systems, culture, right? The sort of geographical or political context that someone was raised in. Um, you've probably heard that cliche, uh, it's like asking a fish what water tastes like. Culture is all around us all the time, impacting how we think of others and ourselves, and it's relevant to mental health. Because remember, of course, we said up here that what is not normal is decided by one's culture. So what might be normal in one culture might be very unusual in another. The biopsychosocial model is an attempt to take in all those different sources of information and use that to understand health. Specific to mental health, again, it may include things like looking at the genetic links for a disorder, looking at the cognitive patterns in folks that are suffering in certain ways, and looking at the sociocultural risk factors and implications that can lead one to struggle with mental health problems. So, uh, just a quick recap, we're covering this early because these are six very important terms to know in abnormal psychology. And um, I think that's all I have for you for right now. So, uh, thanks for watching and stay tuned for more.